Welcome everyone. Welcome to Bees and Biodiversity webinar today. I'm gonna to give you guys a couple minutes to join in. And like you know, pop up where are you coming from today? Okay, New Zealand, California, Texas, California, Canada, Finland, France, everywhere in the globe, New Mexico, too much to read, sorry. Sweden, Portugal, the Netherlands, Nicaragua, Czech Republic, Scotland, Italy. Wow, thank you guys, everyone from everywhere, including Oregon, so. <laughs> <laughs> Bulgaria, Saudi Arabia. Virginia, Hawaii, Denmark. everywhere, Slovenia, awesome, Canada. Greece, Greece, Germany, Switzerland, yay, it so, is, go ahead, Elaine, sorry, it's definitely a worldwide um, interest, learning about bees and biodiversity, yes, thank you so much, everyone, to join us today uh alex uh you have a video for us correct alex actually already played the video so you're you're okay. able to progress forward to the next slide okay thank you guys <laughs> so it is my uh duty to just review the instructions i know that majority of you guys at this point it's well known about the rules but for those of you that's the first time let's refresh that You'll be muted during the duration of the webinar, just to make sure that everyone is going to have a good audio for uh, us to enjoy this great webinar. Uh, and please enter your question to the panelists in the Zoom Q&A session. So you should have this option very clear for you. If not, just uh, type your question in the chat and our team will help you on that. Uh, you can converse with the other attendees in the chat, but please be polite. We are here to enjoy this great moment and learn a lot and enjoy this great session. So uh, just uh, to give a quick, kick, sorry, a quick uh, introduction of what we're going to see today, we're going to have a five minutes of quick introduction, which all, we are already doing. Uh, then we're going to have around five 55 minutes uh, on bees and biodiversity presentation with Sone uh, Copain. Uh, she's the president and founder of Bee Foundation. And then we're gonna go for the discussion Q&A for about another 60 minutes. Without further ado, we have the pleasure to introduce Sone Copain today. She's the director of Bee Foundation in the Netherlands. Uh, we have Dr. Elaine Ingham here today, founder, soil microbiologist of Soil Food Web School, and I am your host for today. So, Sony and Elaine, if you want to, let's go with Sony first, if you want to introduce yourself to our guests. Yes, um, thank you so much. I am excited to uh, tell you something about bees and biodiversity. Um, today, tonight, here tonight, and um, I give you another introduction in a few minutes. Elaine? You there we go, I'm okay. muted. <laughs> <laughs> it worked, the button worked for everybody. So I'm a founder of the Soil Food Web School, and where we are trying to understand that entire web below ground, what that is uh, influencing plant um, resilience, biodiversity, uh, how nutrient cycling actually happens in the soil, how we can hold on to water by getting the proper sets of microorganisms rebuilding structure. There's about 11 overarching principles that we talk about um, in the Soil Food Web School. And so uh, come and join us in the foundation classes so you too can learn and understand how important all of this biology is. And of course, with respect to bees, well, from a microbiologist point of view, bees are absolutely wonderful taxi cabs. 
they will get you everywhere. And we have the pleasure to have John Lu with us today. John, do you want to say a few words for us? Um, well, hello from the COP15 in Montreal. Um, I'm going to mute myself because it's pretty loud here in the press, press room, but uh, thank you for having me and um, I'm happy to be able to be here. Thanks so much. It's always our pleasure. Without further ado, let's start the presentation today. Sone, take in, please. Yes, you can continue. I think. Next one. Okay. Yeah. So John introduced it already. Uh, he is at the COP today, but um, we see everywhere this um, um, that we are in bad shape is as concerned biodiversity. And um, I will present something about bees in relation to biodiversity. And I'm excited to, uh, to do it. So let's continue. Please, next one. I want to start with uh, uh, asking you some questions. Please, the first question. So how many bee species exist worldwide? What do you think? You oh. should be able to see a pool popping up in your screen if you want to put that. But we have a lot of Ds, some Bs. Yeah. And do we have the pool outcome? Yeah, we have majority of them with letter D. Uh, C is just coming close by. Uh, B also is, getting, is catching up in the game. So we have okay. about 34%. Oh, it's changing. Okay. <laughs> Should, okay, <laughs> it's popping up. <laughs> I can't even read. Okay, now it's stabilized. So we have 35% uh, uh, with letter C, 32% with letter D, 28% with B, and 7% with A. Okay, so we are at 20,000 species of uh, bees in the world, worldwide. So that's, that's where we are talking about uh, today, about these 20,000. 20, Next okay, slide. 20,000, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Next one. So the, then how oh. many of them are making honey? Is it just one species or more than 500 species or do they all produce honey? So the push popped up again. We are in a race once more. Okay, majority is with more than 500 so far. In second place, only one bee species. They all produce honey is coming in third place. It's still catching up, numbers changing. Let's see, let's see. So almost 70% of participants read answered. Okay. So what is the uh, main answer? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the final result is 57% uh, with 500 species, more than 500 species. 27% with one, only one yeah. species. Ah, there we see it. And 60% with they all produce honey. Yeah. Now that is a, it's a, it's a good answer. So we have one honeybee species, but we have over 500 species of stingless bees who also produce a little honey. But that's not uh, um, in the commercial. It's not a commercial honey or the honey that is sell sold commercially. Okay, good, good answer. The last one. Yep. So, why are bees important for biodiversity? What percentage of all plants depend on pollination to make seeds? So, what do you th think? Okay, so far 80% is winning the race. It's popping up. Still 80% winning the game. 
Okay, stabilizing. 80% still winning the game. Okay. Yep. <laughs> that's a great uh, that's a great answer. It's um it's it's 87 percent of all plants need pollination by insects. So that's uh, it's a good answer. Great. So let's let's continue. Okay. Yeah. Next one. Next slide. Can you see? My okay. Slide? I okay. I will I will introduce myself shortly. And um, I'm Sona. I was born in a beehive. You see it in the, on the photo. And um, I was, uh, my father was a beekeeper. So he, he made this basket, this, uh, this crib for me as he uh, made his beehives. And um, I, as, a, as a child, I always uh, uh, loved the bees, but also the native species not knowing how, how important these plants are for um, solitary bees. Then um, I started studying um, uh, in Wageningen University. I studied uh, agricultural economics and ecological agriculture. I was fascinated between the clash between uh, the earth and economics. Already in the 90s, it was a problem. Um, not only now. Um, so that's that's what I um, why I went to study then. And um, after that, I I was working in um, with farmers. I worked in uh, Peru for some years and in East Africa. And then uh, now I'm working for more than fifteen years in the Netherlands back home. And since uh, two thousand twelve, I um, I started to be a trainer in natural beekeeping. And then um, quite soon in 2015, I started to uh, train in solitary bees, wild bees and biodiversity. I remember the first um, um, masterclass I gave on bees and worms, it was 2015. That was in, in Amsterdam where, where I met John Liu. And since then we are working together. Yes, next slide, please. And then in 2015, um, uh, I founded Bee Foundation. And what we are doing is we, um, we basically create awareness about uh, pollinators about, um, and, and habitat for pollinators. So we give uh, education. Um, we work a lot with uh, school classes, but also with uh, students and um, yeah, business people. And um, while educating them, I like always to go out and uh, do the planting um, of, of trees and bushes. And sometimes um, we call it, we give bees things. And that basically is if we want, if we need to, to be present in the uh, political, uh, political field. So for example, we did a lot in the um, uh, European bee guidance where still a lot of uh, um, pesticides are being used uh, who are very harmful for bees. So that is basically what, uh, what the field of Bee Foundation is. And we use always the bees as, as I see it as they are a window on um, to connect or to reconnect with nature. Um, so that's, the, yeah, for, for many, many people, they are an, an entrance what, what are, where they easily can connect with and where they want to do something for. So we didn't know when we started doing it, but it, it is growing and growing and growing this, this um, awareness, but also this, the warm heart people have for bees. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and on the other slide, there were some prizes. We won quite some prizes with the work. And this was also in the, in the um, prize about big data for bees. Here you see me with the Minister of Agriculture. She's 
on the left side of the picture, handing out the, the price of the big data for bees. We made um, a, a, a game uh, uh, for bees and biodiversity. Next slide. Okay. Bees and biodiversity, it's all about the birds and the flowers or the birds and the bees. What do you say in, um, in the United States? Birds and the bees, huh? Uh, here in the Netherlands, we say it's all about the bees and the flowers, or it's nowadays, my children will say it's all about sex, mom. <laughs> oh, next one. Um, yes, I have a, the, the disclaimer I want to make is that um, I mainly use Dutch data. I, I don't have a lot of uh, international data. They will be there, but I, I don't have them. Um, but the biological processes, they will hold international, international. So the percentages, they will differ um, in the different areas, but uh, how they live, we will see it. Yeah, next one. Who are they? The bees. And of all animal species, two thirds is insect. So that's an incredible amount of um, is insect on, on earth. And we have this 20,000 bee species worldwide of which one makes honey apart from the 550 stingless bees who produce little honey and 250 are bumblebees and the rest is uh, our solitary wild bees. So they live on their own. Next slide, please. And I uh, will start with this wild bees and um, they can be very small or they can be like two and a half uh, centimeter. This one, what I have on my finger is, is, is quite a big one. It's not a very small one. Some are smaller than the yellow heart of a daisy flower. So really small ones. Come again, next slide, please. And then it's all about sex. Here you see this male um, with the female under him. And these males are always born first. And when they get born, when they are born, they, they are flying like crazy around the flowers to, to, to look for the female ones. And they are born a little bit later um, when, when in spring. Next one, please. And then if they, if they have mated these females, they start to make uh, again their nest. And um, every female is a queen. So every female is laying uh, eggs and every adult is born an orphan. So they never will see their mothers. And most of the nests, they, they make down in the soil. So here, what you see is a nest in, uh, in a sandy soil in the dunes uh, of the Netherlands. Next slide, please. And here you see her digging the, the nest or the nest entrance. She already made the nest uh, chamber. Uh, and now she is, she's coming with a lot of pollen on her legs, going in the soil. And she, I was lucky that she didn't see me. Um, they really don't like to, to see people around and they keep so silent and you can wait and wait. And uh, it's hard to see them again. But here, this in the Netherlands, it's over 70% that are ground nesters. Internationally, I don't know. But here only 10% um, brood in these bee hotels that, that nowadays are made for them. But when they look for places to, to make nests, they will always look for the sunny places. They are really uh, admiring uh, the warm sun places and they like open spots. So they like the spots where, where are no grasses, no other plants. Sometimes they can be grasses, but they, they, it should not be uh, a heavy biomass. Then, then they don't dig their nest. 
and then they don't fly far. So they will need flowers between 150 up to 500 meters from their nests. So they, they really, they only go maximum half a kilometer from their nest to look for flowers. So they, they, there's, there's an advantage in there, in this, that small spots, small of in nature, can be holding many solitary bees, but um, um, when when you, you have two um, less less flowers, then it's very hard for them to to move to move to other places to find enough flowers, mm -hmm. uh, or to also for the males to uh, to to hop to other bee oases to find uh, females to mate with. So that's. Next slide, please. And here you see um, um, a nest from the inside. This is uh, in the, um, how do you say it? You see, um, you see the egg. Carla, maybe you can help us finding the egg by yeah, pointing to the middle one. You see the, mid, the second one, it's a, you get, yeah, that's the egg. And the egg is laid on a teaspoon full of pollen. So this pollen are apple flowers. I was there when, uh, when she was building the nest. And then she, she brings in a teaspoon full of pollen. She is working for it almost a day. So she's starting in, in the morning when it's, when, the, when it's getting warm. And then she's working gathering the pollen up to two, three o'clock. And then she's putting, laying one egg on it. And afterwards she's looking for material soil to cover that nest, that room. And then next day she is make, again going for a teaspoonful of pollen. And in this way, she will be laying about 20 eggs in her life. On, the, on the, the bottom line, you see the bee entering with pollen. Yes, there she is. So it's always uh, about 20 um, eggs a female is laying. And the last one in a row, that is the male, um, the, 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 the male egg. So you can say the males are protecting the female eggs, um, but also when another animal is coming in to eat these nice uh, juicy larvas, uh, they will pick first the males. So they are the losers if, if an, another animal is coming to eat them, but they are protecting the females. That's the good thing of it. So next slide, please. And here you see a, an, um, a, a one new one being born. Um, if a larva is, had eaten all this pollo, pollen, then it becomes a pupae and it stays underground like seeds. So mainly if, if here it, these ones are laying eggs in May, the pupa are ready in June and they are laying like seeds until next year, May, these apple flowers are flowering again and then they, they hatch. So they are really most of their lifetime, they are under in, uh, are in the ground. Yes, next slide, please. And then they, they, the flowers are so important to feed this uh, larva um, because this is the, um, the vegetarian proteins. Eh? So the, the pollen are the proteins for, and that's the food for the larva. And most of them eat pollen from uh, Aster family. And next slide, please. Or the parsley family. Next slide, please or the bean family, next slide please, or the labellum family. So that, these are families with huge variety of flowers and most of the bees go either to them all or are connected to, to one in particular, one family in particular. 
Next to this, they also go to the flowers in, uh, in shrubs and bushes and trees. So this is our only the meadow uh, flowers. Next slide, please. Yes, but some larvae, they are already dieting even just when they are a larva, when they are young, young kid, not even a bee. And they eat only pollen from one specific flowering plant. So for example, this Melita nigricans, these larvae are only eating this greenish pollen from that flower. And no other flowers they, uh, they, they eat, okay? They are, the, the, the moms are, uh, um, or the larva can be happy that their mom knows it. So, so she, uh, she will only look for those flowers. And this means when those flowers are not there, there's no chance this kind of bee species is living there. And you have, you have it the other way around. If these uh, flowers sometimes de depend completely on one bee species, but more, mostly the bee species depend completely on one flower, like this Melita nigricans. Next, please. Yes, and if you are able to fly uh, approximately 250 meters from nest to flowers, then there's nothing to eat if you live in the Netherlands and have agriculture like this. This is our famous uh, flavor polder. So imagine the impact of uh, monocultures. Uh, and basically what they eat is what they like, what they need is native flowers. And, um, um, and they don't know, we call these weeds. So I, I invite you to, from, from today onwards, to look differently to the weeds all around you. I, I had a, quite a change in my life because I was um, in my garden um, um, always cutting down or tearing out one specific um, wheat. And the, until the moment that I got to learn that there are 27 species of solitary bees living only on that root flower. And then I could see it through the eyes of the bees and say, wow, you are good food. So I give it, uh, since then, I give it also a place. It can't grow everywhere in the garden, but it should grow at some places. Next, please. Yes, I, I have a video and that's, um, um, it's going through what I told to you and it's in Dutch, so you can keep on your Dutch uh, exercise. Alle diersoorten, van pissebed tot olifant, hebben hun plek in het ecologisch systeem. Van de geschatte 8 miljoen diersoorten is twee derde insect. Onderdeel van de insecten zijn de vliesvleugeligen. De bijen horen tot deze orde van vliesvleugeligen. De bijen bestaan uit 20.000 soorten wereldwijd, waarvan in Nederland 360 soorten leven. Eén hiervan maakt honing, 29 behoren tot de hommels, en 330 zijn solitaire wilde bijen. Solitaire bijen leven niet in een volk, maar solitair. 
En elk bijtje dat geboren wordt, wordt als een wees geboren. Elk vrouwtje is een koningin en maakt weer een nest voor het volgende jaar. En vaak doen ze dat onder de grond. Hiervoor hebben ze stuifmeel nodig en hun favoriete bloemen zijn composieten, schermbloemige of lipbloemige. De bloemen die zij bezoeken moeten dicht bij hun nest liggen. Ze kunnen ongeveer 150 tot 500 meter vliegen. Dus je kan je voorstellen wat het effect is van een monocultuur. Daar zijn geen bloeiende bloemen en daar kunnen ze niet het stuifmeel verzamelen wat hun jonkies nodig hebben. 10% van de Nederlandse wilde bijen broedt boven de grond, bijvoorbeeld in een bijenhotel. Het is hier de afgelopen weken ontzettend druk geweest met vrouwtjes wilde bijen die stuifmeel aandroegen. En je ziet hier een klomp stuifmeel. Dit is ongeveer een dag werk om zoveel stuifmeel voor een bij te verzamelen. Hier, hier zien we het bijenhotel, hoe dat er van binnen uitziet. En dan zie je dat er hier... Heel veel stuifmeel ligt. Dat is echt een kleine theelepel vol. Als ze genoeg stuifmeel verzameld hebben, dan uh, gaan ze er uh, niet vooruit in met hun kop eerst, maar met hun kont eerst. En leggen er een eitje op. En dan gaan ze de, de leem, zanderige leem, verzamelen om uh, het deurtje dicht te doen. En dan weer theelepel, stuifmeel, eitje erop, deurtje dicht. Stuifmeel verzamelen, eitje erop, deurtje dicht. Theelepel stuifmeel, eitje erop, deurtje dicht. En zo gaat dat door. Dit is een vrij kort bijenhotel. Ideaal zou het zijn als het uh, 11 centimeter lang was. Want altijd legt ze vrouwtje, 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 vrouwtje. En de laatste is een mannetje. Dus als er een roofinsect komt, uh, is mannetje altijd de pineut. Oftewel... De mannetjes beschermen de vrouwtjes. En die mannetjes in het voorjaar, als opnieuw die appelbomen bloeien, dan pas in dezelfde week, dan worden die mannetjes geboren. En die, uh, gaan, die vliegen als een soort ADHD-typetjes rond dit kastje, totdat dat eerste vrouwtje uh, uh, eruit komt. En daar springen ze bovenop, paren daarmee. En dan gaat dat vrouwtje weer um, een hele cyclus. En dan ontwikkelen die larven zich weer. Die verpoppen zich. En die poppen die liggen eigenlijk de hele winter door als een soort zaden te slapen. Totdat volgend jaar weer diezelfde appelbomen bloeien. En ze weer naar buiten komen om te vliegen. Dus je hebt altijd bij de, bij de wilde bijen. Is elk vrouwtje een koninginnetje dat een nest maakt. En deze koninginnen die zien nooit hun eigen jongen groot worden. Dus de moeders van, van de volgende generatie die zijn nu bijna allemaal al gestorven. Deze metselbijen is een soort die uh, haar larven lusten elk soort stuifmeel. Maar er zijn ook wilde bijen die alleen maar... Die, die al op dieet zijn als larven zijn. Die, willen, die lusten alleen maar stuifmeel van één bepaalde plantenfamilie. Dus die zijn veel specifieker verbonden aan, uh, aan bepaalde planten. En staat die plant er niet, dan is die bij er niet. Het is, dat is een hele intieme uh, afhankelijkheidsrelatie. En het is vaak ook andersom. Is die bij er niet, dan kan die plant zich niet voort planten, dus die kan niet bestoven worden en maakt dan geen zaden. Yes, now we uh, continue to the bumblebees. We call them the humble bees. So we have about 250 species worldwide and they live on most continents. They don't live so much in Africa. They are not so well with um, heat, warmer temperatures, but they can ver do very well in uh, cold temperatures. Um, if you have the queen, she lives alone um, and hibernate in the dry 
season or in the winter. So she's staying either, she's mostly staying underground in um, a mouse hole or a mole um, uh, place where, where she's over -winter wintering. And um, when she, when spring is coming, then you will see only the, the queen bumblebees going out. And she is starting alone a nest. Um, uh, she's starting the nest on her own. And then she is feeding a first generation of larvae who become a first generation of uh, bumblebees. And those first generation is a little bit smaller. So they didn't get a, so that much food to really become uh, grow, big adults. So you can do the next one. And they have about 200 to 300 uh, female, uh, females in the nest. And they start, start to help this queen. And they forage uh, for around uh, one kilometer around this nest. And um, at the end of the season, the new queens for the next years are born and also the males, the drones. And they, um, there's then mating. Um, with drones from the different uh, colonies made with the new queens. And these uh, queens hibernate uh, then uh, during uh, winter and coming out the next growing season. So um, you will see that, that their nesting period is some months from spring to summer. So that's quite a long period. And they are with uh, many individuals. So, so they need a lot of pollen and nectar during that whole time to feed next new queens, uh, to come to, to uh, new queens in this process. And that also makes that um, the bumblebees uh, are the most endangered spe uh, species. In the Netherlands, we have uh, 31 species, but we have um, uh, from the described ones, uh, 27 ones, there's 17 on the red list. So there's uh, several, almost the same holds uh, in, in, in England and Germany and France. The, the numbers can differ a bit, but this, this, is, this has to do with their... Um, um, their way of living that they need for such a long time um, pollen and nectar to bring a new queen. So, and these queens are living only one year. Yeah. And um, the, the change in agriculture and then mainly the change in grasslands that, um, that Caused for them that cause is causing for them the biggest problem. So they miss the clovers basically. Next slide, please. Ah, this was also the only part I have on the about the bumblebees to tell you. And we can go to the small part of the video. Een hommelnest begint in het voorjaar als de koningin wakker wordt uit haar winterpaleis onder de grond. Op het moment dat de krokussen bloeien en de sneeuwklokjes zie je de eerste grote buzzende hommels vliegen. Dat is vaak ook het eerste weekend dat de mannen op hun motoren weer door Nederland rijden en dat het rokjesdag is. Die koningin die verzamelt stijfmeel en nectar en bouwt daar een nestje van met een eerste generatie jonge hommeltjes. En die jonge hommeltjes zijn allemaal ietsje kleiner, want ze zijn um, een beetje ondervoed. Die eerste generatie die gaat dan op pad om stijfmeel en nectar te verzamelen en de koningin blijft binnen. Aan het, aan het eind van de zomer worden dan de jonge koninginnen voor het volgende jaar geboren. Dan op dat moment zijn er ook mannetjes in het volk en vindt de paring plaats. 
En die jonge koninginnen die overwinteren weer onder de grond in een muizenholletje of een mollengang. Hommels die vliegen ongeveer een kilometer rond hun nest. Dus ze hebben een redelijk groot vliegbereik. Maar omdat het hele volk bestaat van het vroege voorjaar tot en met de zomer, hebben ze veel stuifmeel en nectar nodig. En zij zijn ook de meest bedreigde wilde bijen van Nederland. Omdat zij dat hele seizoen een nectar- en stuifmeelstroom nodig hebben voor 200 tot 300 hommeltjes. En als dat wegvalt door een teveel aan monocultuur uh, en het maaien van bermen, uh, dan is er een periode geen voedsel en storten die nesten in de zomer in elkaar. Yes, and then we come to the honeybees. Um, honeybees, they, are, that is, uh, they live as a superorganism. Come on the next. And uh, superorganism, they are never alone. And uh, only one out of the 20,000 bee species are honeybees. And then we have uh, within the honeybees um, specific races, but they all belong to the honeybees. Um, in fact, honeybees, they are uh, insects living in caves, in, the, in, in, in wood, wooden caves or, or rock caves. They're basically bush insects. And um, as their colony is growing in spring, at a certain moment, the, it is split in two or more colonies. And that's what we call swarming. Then that's the moment for them to... Uh, to, to split, but they split and they do it at the moment that the new queens will be born in a, in a week from that. Um, and then they also uh, stay uh, with the queen in this uh, colony during winter. So you see the honeybees, they have their queen in the midst of a group of about 20,000 bees during winter. The bumblebees, the queens, hibernate alone underground. And with the solitary bees, there is no queen. And so they, they are not there in winter. They, they just live for about um, um, six to eight weeks in a year, a specific species. And then it's over for that year. So it is also um, because of the, um, and, and next slide please, because of these honeybees um, live together and the queen is staying over the winter in the colony, that, uh, that they need honey to keep her warm. But more importantly, uh, she is brooding at a temperature of, a temperature of about 35 degrees Celsius. So the honeybee colony, when it's brooding, it's almost so warm as we are. And that's where they need their honey uh, for. So they gather from the flowers from the, from the past year. That is the food for the brood for the second, for the new year coming. And then um, they are interesting be um, because of uh, their flexibility in work division. They have a very strict work division, but if the surrounding, if nature is changing or if, uh, if they are swarming, then they can go back and do the task what they did as a young bee. So if, uh, if you have a worker bee that is uh, going out to forage, she also can do again the task of feeding young larvae, for example. Um, and they, they, uh, they go out um, for three to five kilometer around their nest. They are looking for, uh, for flowers and they eat all flowers. They, they will go to every flower. So that are the main characteristics of the honeybees. And then when you go to next slide, um, you have this uh, tropical st stingless bees. 
there are about 550 species of, of them. And they make um, tiny bits of, um, of honey. And they produce the honey in these uh, bigger open cells you see in, maybe Carla, you can go with the cursor to, yeah, you see on the outer part is bigger cells that are their honey pots. It's looking like uh, how the bumblebees are making it. And there's some, there's only one species what can produce to up to 12 liters a year, but it's very uh, delicate and um, a thin honey with a lot of um, medicinal uh, properties. Thank you very much. Then we continue to the last part of the video or the, second, the third part, not the last. Een van die 360 soorten bijen die in Nederland leven is de honingbij. En zij zijn ook de enige die honing verzamelen. Zij hebben een vliegbereik van 3 tot 5 kilometer en lusten net als de hommels alle soorten bloemen. En nesten van honingbijen bestaan vele generaties achter elkaar. Het is te vergelijken met een stad waar ook generatie naar generatie in leeft. En in tegenstelling tot de hommels en de solitaire bijen overwintert de koningin met een groep vrouwtjesbijen, met een groep werksterbijen. Yes, and then we go to uh, what's their importance. So, next slide, please. Um, you were quite right in the, in, the, in the quiz question that no bees, no seeds. So it's, uh, it's really 87% uh, of all plants that need pollination. Huh? And the flowers are food for the in insects, so they give them pollen and nectar. But then you get these seeds you get the genetic diversity by uh, cross-pollinization. And also these seeds are food for many, many animals. And the seeds that become plants, they, that, they provide the coverage of the earth. So they give cooling to the earth. They give this, that the plants, they, they look for the CO2 storage. They store sugars. They, they are directly food for animals. They are the organic material and then afterwards food for soil organisms. Like what their roots are doing, they, give the, they put the air in the ground, they make the soil possible that it's uh, storing water, they make minerals available, and they also are organic material for food soil organisms. So these plants, um, are there because of bees are there. And um, then a question would be, maybe next slide, what if there's no bees? Who are then the main poll uh, pollinators? Or why, no, yeah, that's the, that's the third question. Let's start with the third question. Who's the main pollinator when there are no, when there are no bees? or before the bees existed. So before 66 million years ago, who was main pollinator? So who can put something in the, yes, exactly, the wind, the wind. Yes, now butterflies a little bit, ants a little bit, birds a bit, little, little, little bit. So why are uh, ants and butterflies not made the main pollinators? Why are the bees the main pollinator? This is the first uh, question. Can you put it then answer in the chat? The numbers, the hairs, they have. Uh, yeah, they are fuzzy, yes. Yeah, so that's because of their larvae eat pollen. Yeah, 
So there's no other, no flies, they don't eat pollen, their larva. The, the, for the butterflies, they don't eat pollen. So it's only the bees that their larva eat pollen. So these female uh, bees, they are just looking for food for their larva. In meanwhile, through their fuzzy hairs, they pollinate uh, almost all the plants. Uh, and there's um, before the time that, uh, that the bees existed, that was around 60 million years ago, in the time of the dinosaurs, that at the end of the time of the di dinosaurs, the bees uh, came into existence in relationship with their uh, flowers. And before that time, it was only the wind who was the pollinator. Yes. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so no bees, no food. And you see here the bees on top that pollinate the flowers and then they produce the, the fruits uh, that are eaten by mammals, the fruits that are eaten by, by birds and the birds uh, or the mammals are eaten by foxes and, and other birds, they're all. So you see here um, that bees are Next slide, please. Bees are the buzzing heart. I miss one. Bees are the buzzing heart of nature. And also we depend on their uh, pollinization because this we can eat when uh, we have an abundance of bees. And if there's no bees, then this will see, uh, next slide, you will see this. So that's an enormous reduction of our uh, foods without bees for um, two quarters of, of, of our food depend on pollinization. So of every um, four spoons we eat, three we think we have thanks to the bees. So you can see they are, next slide please, they are the buzzing heart of nature for already over 60 million years. And they, they, um, uh, they, are, they like these weeds, the herbs, the native species. They are already there also 60 million years. So they don't depend so much on the crops and on the flowers that we cultivated. That's, that's, that's not of their interest. Next one, please. But then we've, we are at this moment in an incredible insect decline. You see here uh, on the left side, the 75% the, uh, decline of insect mass in 27 years. This was a study done um, in Germany in nature reserves. So in, in more than 60 nature reserves, they, they counted this loss of insect mass. So it's, that's including all the insects. And if we have here um, uh, in the Netherlands, we have 55% of all our bees are on the red list. And worldwide is that 40%. So it's an incredible um, decline what we are facing now. Next slide, please. And if you go to this uh, overview picture of the um, uh, Stockholm Resil Resilience uh, Center, then you see also, um, for example, compared to climate change, the upper red um, part, you see by the biodiversity loss as incredible amount uh, over the, the capacity of the earth to uh, re uh, regenerate itself. Um, and maybe I have a short question for you. So do you recognize biodiversity love, uh, loss in your lifetime? Or do you hear your parents talking about species that, that you never saw? Maybe you can put something in the chat. Yes, 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 yes. What did you see? Yes. So it's very, um, I, I see many yes. 
But for example, um, um, we I know that as a kid, um, when we went for a trip by car, it was the car was full of in dead insects when we came home. So we had to wash it. And now you 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 don't need to wash your car anymore, at least not from um, from dead insects. And um, I see it also that I, when I was uh, born, there were many, many dandelions in the, in the grasslands, and now they are not there anymore. Next slide, please. So we have this loss um, due to uh, uh, agriculture and the way we do agriculture, this industrialization of agriculture. When we have these monocultures, there's nothing else growing in between. So no herbs, no, no spots for bees to get some pollen. The scale of the fields has increased incredible. Then the pesticides or the herbicides killing the bees and the, and the, and the plants. The fertilizers um, making it impossible for many herbs to grow. And I put another one um, that 70% of the agricultural land is owned by 1% of the companies. So we have um, not so much to say anymore about our agricultural land. And these companies are um, having it, making industrialized agriculture. Yes, and next slide, please. Then we go what they need. Eh? So it's very simple what they need. They need what everyone needs. They need a bed and they need to food. They need bed and breakfast. And they need that in, in approximately uh, 500 meters from uh, spot from spot. Eh? So B oasis from B oasis needs a maximum of 500 meters to be able to fly to another spot. So you need also this green uh, ways in between to come from the one to the one to the other uh, spot and then they need flowers in the whole growing season so not only in spring but but from early spring to autumn they need uh, to have flowers and that's not for one species but it's for the many species that, that they are you have are there you have this spring species but you have also autumn species next one please and then you, they, um, what they, they go and, and um, look for flowers in the trees, in the high trees, in the lower trees, in the shrubs and bushes, in the grasslands, at the water sites, and also water plants. So they look for the native species, and we can help them uh, with ecosystem restoration or in agriculture to include this native species again and to work in all layers of, of nature. And they are, they are everywhere. So these are the layers what also are also used in permaculture or in agroforestry. And you come to the next slide, please. Um, and that, that is um, basically we have to revalue uh, native uh, species, what we call weeds. They don't know the word. But if you see that, um, that overview, that is the herbs in grasslands in the 1950s in the Netherlands. So, for example, at that moment, you, there was white clover in 97% uh, of all grasslands. So bumblebees had incredible amount of, um, of uh, flowers to feed on. And on clover, there, there are uh, 67 species of insects fly on clover. And on, for dandelion, it is over 100 species that forage on clovers. And it was also available in 97% of all grasslands. So you see here a list of the main um, uh, herbs, native herbs that were around. So you can also see in the 50s, there was not that uh, insect problem, what we face today. And if you know these native species, it is also quite easy to reverse it. It takes about five years of good management to get them back and to get this system 
uh, yeah, to reverse it. So that's quite fast. We can do incredible amounts. Next slide, please. Yeah, and if you go to crop farming or horticulture, then uh, and you think bees are there in all these layers of nature, you uh, all uh, principles of agroforestry, what you can integrate on your farm will help them to, uh, to find a living and to make nests. Yes, next one. And that is here, we are working with a group of farmers in this um, incredible monoculture part of the Netherlands. And um, we are looking with them uh, to the herbs, what are na in, native in the Netherlands and where, uh, how to mow it and how to maintain it um, to get more native species. So at the moment we uh, we are working with about seventy five kilometer of, um, of 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 grasslands um, alongside the ditches, where they started to to reverse uh, it and to 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 get um, through mowing uh, differently, get their species back. And it's uh, it's working, and it's nice to um, to be with them, and it's uh, um, uh, empowering that they that they are they are very much committed to the project. Yes, one. I think this is um, um, what I wanted to tell, and we have last part of the video. Um, after this, what shall we do? It's about five minutes, but we are also on uh, on the time. Yeah, let's watch the video and then you decide what you want to do. And then we go to the Q&A. Deal. Yeah. Alle bijen hebben als gezamenlijk uh, kenmerk dat ze stuifmeel aan hun jonkies voeren. Stuifmeel wat ze verzamelen bij de bloemen. En dat is een plantaardige eiwitbron. Daarin verschillen ze bijvoorbeeld van, van de wespen die uh, mugjes en uh, vlees uh, verzamelen en dat aan hun larven voeren. En bijen die halen uh, van de bloemen het stuifmeel, het voer, het eiwitbron voor hun jongen. En dat doen zowel de honingbijen... De wilde bijen, dat zijn dus de verschillende solitaire bijen, als ook de hommels. Het zijn dus de vegetariërs onder de insecten. Met dat zij stuifmeel verzamelen en aan hun jonkies voeren, bestuiven zij en passant 85% van alle planten op aarde. Dat betekent dat ook onze gezondheid direct samenhangt met de nijvere arbeid van bijen. En in de afgelopen 60 miljoen jaar is die, uh, dat verbond tussen bloem en bij ontstaan. En zijn die bijen altijd in relatie tot hun bloemen ontstaan. En uh, voor die periode, dus dat is de tijd dat de dinosaurussen leven, was de wind... De grote bestuiver op aarde. En uit die tijd stammen ook nog de bomen, zoals de dennenbomen. En die hebben wind, die, hun stuifmeel verbreidt zich met de wind. En na de tijd van de dinosaurussen is die relatie tussen, tussen bloemplant, kleurrijke plant en bij ontstaan. En die, die relatie tussen, tussen bij en plant is een Ongelooflijk, onwaarschijnlijk intieme relatie. En de solitaire bijen, hommels en honingbijen, zijn dé bestuivers op aarde, omdat zij hun jonkies stuifmeel voeren. Zo wordt drie kwart van al ons voedsel bestoven, waaronder 90 van de meest uh, belangrijke handelsgewassen. Dus bijen zijn niet alleen belangrijk voor onze gezondheid, ze zijn ook nog eens ontzettend belangrijk voor de vitaliteit van onze economie. Bijen hebben tegelijkertijd 
enorm moeilijk. In Nederland staat 50% van de wilde bijensoorten op de rode lijst. En wereldwijd is dat 40%. En dat heeft te maken met de verandering van landgebruik, met name vanaf de Tweede Wereldoorlog. Onder de leus nooit meer honger hebben we een enorme verandering van het landbouwsysteem doorgevoerd. Waarbij schaalvergroting, monocultuur, ontwatering en zware bemesting centraal stonden. En je kan je voorstellen dat in die industriële landbouw geen ruimte is voor bijen. Daarnaast speelt onze volksaard ook een rol. Wij houden van strak en netjes. Tegeltuinen, strak gemaaide gazons en netjes gemaaide bermen leveren niet de bloemen die de bijen nodig hebben. Dus wat moeten we doen? We hebben te zorgen voor bloeiende weides, bloeiende struiken en bloeiende bomen. En dat van het vroege voorjaar tot de late herfst. Dus laat de weides weer vol uh, witte en rode klavers staan. Daar is het voedsel waar alle bijen dol op zijn. En gooi die tegels uit je tuin en zet het vol planten die bloeien. En dan zie je altijd, altijd als er een bloeiende plant is, dan beloof ik je, er komt een wilde bij. Dus die bijen zorgen voor diversiteit en overvloed. Zij zijn het zoemende hart van het ecosysteem. Zij zijn het zoemende hart van de natuur. Zij zorgen dat iedereen te eten heeft. Dat wij te eten hebben, want drie van elke vier happen voedsel die wij eten, hebben we aan de insecten te danken. Maar ook dat de vogels te eten hebben, dat de kikkers te eten hebben, dat ze zelf in overvloed zijn, zodat ze zelf voedsel zijn voor vogels. Dus die bijen zorgen voor overvloed. Hey. Yes. Let's. Do let's... you want to continue or should we skip to Q&A? Uh, let's go to Q&A and then uh, okay. we can bring in these uh, questions. You want to? Yeah. Okay. So the first question. Uh, in regenerative agriculture, there is a big focus on getting soils more fungal dominant and higher in succession. However, when I look at our little pra prairie here on very bad soils, I see that the early successional herbs and weeds seem to attract a lot of pollinators. Some are the host plants of butterflies, confirmed, and especially the small flowers on some weeds seem no. to be... Sorry? Okay. Uh, I lost a little bit, sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, some uh, weeds seem to be favored by the small Andrena bees. Having bare spots of soil also seem ideal for solitary bees that live on the ground. When we start to regenerate the soils and add a wide diversity of native flowers and herbs, should we also keep some parts in a lower successional stage for the pollinators? We want more productive soils, but we don't want to get rid of the rare native bees that visit us. We have wildlife, but the big soil disturbers like wild pigs can't enter it. So we would need to prepare these posts ourselves. Should we keep parts in lower succession stage? And if so, how would we optimally do this. Thank you, Frederick. Okay, thank you very much. Nice uh, observation that if you uh, have these good soils, you have the native species, you get also very many different species of bees. And um, yes, it is, of course, if we don't have big mammals um, uh, uh, eating bush and shrubs and we lose our grasslands. And if you want to keep grasslands, we have to be ourselves uh, these um, um, uh, mowers. 
and then um, you have uh, to mow it in a way that uh, how, for example, a cow will do it. You graze it and you take it and uh, not leave hay um, for more than um, a few days on a spot because then it will um, uh, work contrary. You will lose uh, plant species. So if you, if you mow, then you take the hay away and then um, you will um, uh, uh, keep this grasslands. Yeah. So Elaine and John, feel free to chime in whenever you guys want to add any extra information, please. One of the reasons we um, have gone ahead and, and encouraged people to mow and leave those residues on the surface of the soil is because if you have been the um, numbers of bacteria and fungi, protozoans and um, nematodes, earthworms, all of the creatures of the soil food web, if you have a good community, they will decompose those residues and produce really good soil organic material. And that's a critical part of the system that we have just obliterated with our chemical agriculture, with the constant tillage, with the use of the pesticides and the inorganic fertilizers. That's what we'd like to do everywhere is get the natural system back into order because even agriculture, even feeding human beings is going to be dealt with. We can also feed bees, we can feed um, earthworms, we can feed everything that makes these wonderfully diverse systems. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they can spend. Yeah. yeah, John, please. Well, if I would just add one thing, I would say um, we haven't understood the, the real economics of, of what's happening, that um, the value of ecological function, pollination, fertile living soils, <clears throat> this is not in the GDP economy. And so it's, it's basically false. And as long as we leave this in place, we are creating a perverse incentive to degrade the earth system. And I think it's so wonderful that we can talk in such depth and beauty about pollination because it <clears throat> brings out the complexity and, and the beauty that is, is there, whereas most of the conversations here at the top are abstracted into policy and kind of reductionist theoretical discussions. It's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't touch you in the heart. It doesn't make you see the, the beauty. And that's what I think um, is so amazing about, about what the B Foundation has been doing. And it's really helping, I know, in Europe to, for people to see what is the meaning of this. And I think it would be great worldwide. Yeah, hands-on is the key, right? Yeah. <laughs> we can spend hours on this question, but let's move to the next one. This is the beauty, right? Each quiet stays. So what's the most pragmatic posture in re regards of Apis mellifera versus all other pollinators? Apis mellifera is said to be quite aggressive in regard to resources sharing. Thank you, Florescence. I think I said your name correct. Um, I don't know if I understand the question okay. quite well. Um, is it about a competition? Is the question about competition between Apis mellifera, the, the honeybee versus the solitary bees? That's how I see it. Yeah. Or aggressive in regard resource to resource sharing. Yes, now um, I can, as I understand it, it's, it's a question, how is it between the competition between the honeybees and the solitary bees, the wild bees. Um, it's uh, uh, discussed the past years quite often. And um, 
the what I know is in the Netherlands, we lost over the past 150 years, 87% um, of our biodiversity. Yeah, so um, we have, no, 83%. We have 17% of the biodiversity of 150 years ago, we have still have. So we have a shortage all over. And um, we can discuss a lot in, in, about the competition between honeybees and uh, solitary bees, and then do nothing on increasing biodiversity. Uh, and that's the only answer that we have to do. And then meanwhile, yes, we have to look that uh, if there is, um, is a solitary bee, what is uh, on the red list, what needs a very specific flowers um, that we don't go when that flower is flowering with millions and millions of honeybees to that same spot. That's, that's if for a short time, that's the solution. But really the only solution is biodiversity, increasing biodiversity. And yeah, that's my answer. Any input, Elaine? Not for now. Sorry, I'm answering somebody on okay. the chat. So you're going <laughs> to okay. have to. <laughs> We're going to catch up you with you in the next question, okay. which is quite similar to this one. I, I see as a compliment. Uh, since some of us have limited space and limited time, is there a list of some of the best native wildflowers to plant? I wrote down the plant families, but I'm wondering about the species for different ecoregions. Is there a quick and dirty research at that level? Thank you for the question, Laurie. Um, yes, that's a good question. And no, I have no answer to it um, because it's depending on the regions. So I would say you have this, this uh, that's why I put these four families and there are everywhere species of these four families. So look around and see where they are. And um, then you will find that you probably don't have to plant them, probably not, but just uh, let, let uh, go, give place to what is growing naturally in your place. Give that space and have a look when it's flowering, who is there, what different kind of insects will you see, will you find on your plants? It will be probably amazing. So it's more uh, about doing less uh, than uh, doing a lot and planting the wrong, probably than the wrong plants. Um, so it's an invitation to look to the natural herbs, what are already there if you let them, leave them growing. I saw your hands up, Elaine. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> when You have to list. <laughs> when, when people want to you know, grow an um, indigenous set of plants, things that are um, going to help bring back the natural system, um, probably the best place I know to recommend to you is the Native Plant Societies. And there's typically one in every state in the United States, up in Canada. And I assume that there are Native Plant Societies all over the world. I just haven't had to use them yet. So you get the low understory uh, plants growing that will allow you to grow you know, taller crops, the grasses, the um, corn, other um, uh, agriculturally more expensive um, plants, but you get the understory plants that protect that soil, that prevent um, loss of nutrients that keep the microorganisms we've got to keep the microorganisms growing and so they'll have that food resource it would be food resources all year long uh, in some places uh, uh, so i really encourage people to grow locally available indigenous species of plants it then really enhances the indigenous species of microorganisms in the soil food web. So we start rebuilding things from the, from the 
deepest root in the in the soil all the way up to the top of the tallest tree. Yeah. Here, mainly in the Netherlands, we uh, we want everyone wants to do something for bees, and then um, everyone is doing the wrong things because commercial uh, um, companies they are very good in providing uh, seed mixes for bees, and then you get all those plants what are coming from the south of France or Eastern Europe, and and they pollute the the native species here. And yes, of course, they give pollen and they give nectar. And yes, of course, you will see many honeybees because they like all flowers. You see mm -hmm. bumblebees because they like all flowers. But it's all growing on place where native species could grow. So that's why I recommend just look carefully what's there, what wants to grow there, and then um, yeah, try to look through the eyes of the bees and you will find the, sp the species that are common to your place and um, see them differently. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's about to reconnect with nature, right? It's not just what we want to see, it's what they need. So reach out the the local sources, I think is the best one from my understood, right, Sone? Yeah, and it's not what we think they need. Mm -hmm. It is what we actually see and observe they are going to. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that looking and 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 holding um, your actions, withholding your actions and just looking where are they, where are they going, that changed my whole uh, connection with the bees, but also with nature. And from there. I can start building. And now I know, now I know, now. And you that, so, that, so I, I want to finish because <laughs> that, 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 that looking through the eyes of the bees that really made for me the connection. And then it's like you, you, you enter in a flow in a river and every day you will discover uh, new things, new uh, and, and you, you, when you see it, you can't not see it anymore. <laughs> Never. <laughs> yeah, Elena, sorry. No, no. Yeah, I can't understand. <laughs> well, I, I think you're kind of underscoring exactly what I'm saying is we have to have people who know something about who are the native plants here. Uh, with, what is what's the diversity? How do I? You know, so they come to you, you can train them, you can help them understand, just as the native plant societies around the world will help people, if you've got one, if you're lucky enough to have people who are already that interested, um, and they can give you the seeds that have not had any um, um, fertilizers put on them, that have not had any pesticides, they've, they're truly, you um, supposed to go back into the system and they'll let you know whether this is a short growing plant or if it's tolerant to partial sun um, how tall is it going to grow all, all of those things made easy for people to find those plant species and plant the maximum diversity because you don't really know what's going to grow very very well because it's been how many years in toxic chemical land? Um, you, we've got to start from ground zero in mm. many places. Yeah, and I like what Elaine said, especially if you're working on this path on your backyard, on the small areas, landscape is everything. So choose wisely which kind of plants will survive in the area that you are working with. Yes, John? I, I would just mention that um, in, in the anthroposophic and and biodynamic world, there are areas which have not had any fertilizers or pesticides for a hundred years. And um, it's, it's quite extraordinary to go to these places. We need to, we need to understand this and, and study this. And that's, that's where Sona's family is <clears throat> going even back further, like 200 and longer in, in organics. It's, it's really remarkable. Yeah. Thank you for all the hard work, Sonny. Next question. Okay. 
Is it difficult to introduce colonies to new environments? We just bought a parcel of land that was used for agriculture, growing hay and corn, and we want to plant flowering trees and flowers. Jana or Yana, I don't know which country you are coming for, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I have to think about it. Yeah. Um, you can always, I understand if you're talking about colonies, I understand you are talking about honeybees because that are the only one who is living in a colony and kept. And, uh, and bumblebees are also living in a colony, but I don't think you are asking for bumblebees. But um, uh, uh, corn and hay sounds like uh, not a huge variety of plants. So I would like, I would advise you to start in increasing the amount of plants, the, the number of species, and then uh, have a good look what is coming, who is there, is there a honeybee, is there a bumblebee, bumblebees you will, you will recognize, and, and the honeybees, they are almost the biggest bee after the bumblebee, and then maybe you see small insects and you think it's a fly and then it may, might be a bee, but there's so many nice software on your phone um, and you can make a picture and you can see, oh, is it a bee or a fly? And you, every day you, you will uh, learn more and year after year you will learn more. Uh, so just start, start it and start with increasing uh, variety of native uh, species, plant species, and not by bringing in bees. They will, they will die if there's not enough food around and they need enormous amount of uh, food, honeybees. So do you think one growing season should be enough of preparing the area or what else we should look for when taking these decisions? Uh, look, if you have a, a honeybee colony um, searching for food in five kilometers, mm -hmm. and that's in, in a circle around the, the hive, count the number of hectares it is searching for food. That is, uh, your plot is, is, is probably a little tiny bit from this whole area. So look to the landscape, look what is growing in the landscape. Are you in an agricultural landscape as what I showed you the pictures of? Forget about it. You, there's no honeybee living. There's no bee living, <laughs> nothing. Um, but are you in a wonderful nature reserve uh, full of flowers? Then that's absolutely not a problem and you... You, then if it's if it's already abundant then I would also not um, be uh, worried about a lot of comp competition between solitary bees and and uh, honeybees but then then it's when there is abundance True. yeah yeah I don't know the area yet <laughs> <laughs> yes it's it's hard right yeah yeah. So uh, just like uh, extrapolating in here is just, I don't know if it's just my brain going wild, but uh, when I saw the, when we see big areas of monoculture, do you see any benefit on building like a big ring connected around the area with big colonies or it's not worth the work? No, uh, if I get you well, you mm -hmm. you have you have um, a, a ring around the agricultural yeah. uh, area, and there you put colonies. Where will they mm -hmm. go to to look for their flowers? Yeah, I mean, but right. Uh, my my question was not that clear. But if we can have this ring outside the area with uh, also ring of flowers that will provide food. Do you think that this would be a nice design? I'm trying to think about uh, how can we introduce these concepts with big farmers because they gonna have they'll be resistant to leave spaces in their farm for just for bees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I for for um, big farmers, I would not uh, focus on uh, honeybees, but on wild bees. Okay. 
solitary bees. So, and that means make uh, the place suitable with uh, native plants for wild bees to settle. Mm. And and for bumblebees to settle and make the soils build that in a way that they can go in, be happy when there is a mole uh, or when there are, are mouse nesting underground. Um, uh, and, and your bumblebees will nest in those holes, uh, uh, but they need food. So, so uh, you... If you if you go, if you want to introduce honeybees, you stay in this industrial thinking, uh, I guess. And um, the the way to go is to make the agricultural um, uh, wo interwoven with this native species, and then a place for, for solitary bees to live, and not introduce them as 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 also a one solution fit for a pollination problem. Makes sense. As, as we do now, eh? so, so it's, it's, we bring the hives in, we bring some species of um, solitary bees, the, the pupa, we, we harvest the pupa, we, we put them in the cool cell, we bring them in when, when the pears and the, and the apples are flowering and then nothing, eh? or then mm -hmm. they need to reproduce. So we make it very, um, as, as, as a beekeeping, another way of beekeeping and then with solitary bees, instead of making the whole area uh, a, a, a paradise for a solitary bees. And it, that should be done and not, not a one, not a, not a, pollin a pollination solution. Makes sense. Thank you. Next question. Okay. What's the best way to hear bees in colder climates? Are there any good classes for beekeeping? Letizia, thank you for your question. Mm, what's colder climate? Is that the Netherlands? We have uh, minus eight today, and that's nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, nah, if, you, if you go to beekeeping classes, um, um, then what, what, uh, what I found everywhere around that it's not about natural beekeeping, but it's about industrial beekeeping. Bees are there for us, for honey. And that's not true. Honey is, 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 is something for bees. And, and maybe if there's abundance, we can harvest some. But so in, in the courses I give, I turn it around. I, 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 I bring you into contact with bees and their environments and start to love also the honeybees because they are amazing. They are absolutely amazing. And that's why it's also very sad to, to talk about this competition between honeybees and solitary bees, because then somehow the honeybees are thrown away and they are amazing animals. It's a super organism. Now, who knows what is a super organism and you can live with it. So it's, but so, um, yeah, it is, it is, uh, there is, of course, um, beekeeping classes for colder climates. And then please look for, for the, the, the most natural beekeeper you can find in your area who is not feeding with, with sugars, who is just keeping them maybe in indigenous hives and not in these commercial hives, just and, and, and live with them. It's about living together, starting to love each other. Yep. And they will love you back. That's exactly. That's... <laughs> it's... Uh reconnecting right see yeah, ourselves as, as part of the system and not uh, alien that has yeah. the right to do whatever yeah but that's seeing we are all aliens nowadays True. yeah <laughs> somehow but True. but then um uh, connecting with them you, you you your heart starts to move when you when you you you, you only can love them if you see them I can talk whatever I can talk, but if I show you a beehive from inside, you say, oh, <laughs> so then the bees are telling, I, I keep quiet and then it's done and people, then you want to care for them. And if you want to care for them, you are going to work with these indigenous plants, with these herbs, and you will also um, um, eat food 
from places where where bees can live. So you will automatically draw, go to this uh, agroforestry or, or, or small scale organic um, uh, places where you can buy food. They are everywhere around. That's, that's also beautiful from mm -hmm. this time. It's compared to the 90s, there's much more possibility to, 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 for, for gardens where you can, can get your own food. So are you buying? Yeah. I, I, at least that's my experience. I, I don't think, Elena, what do you think? You're muted, Elaine. When I when I mute myself, I, that means I'm usually over there in the webinar chat <laughs> answering somebody's question. So could you br briefly outline what your question to me was? Oh, I I, I was talking about my experience about that that um, if people see the bees, then they start loving them, and then they are st start connecting them, um, and then they want to grow this native species and and give place to this native species. They want to do something for them, and then they can also go to these places where you can buy your uh, uh, vegetables and fruits uh, from from gardens and from agriculture. What is also fit for bees, so it's. It's moving you along the way. And then I, I ask, what's your experience? What do you think to it? <laughs> um, I enjoy the bees out in my yard, in, in my landscape, but I tend to, they, they stay over there and I stay over here because I really don't want to interfere with them because then you might get stung. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, so, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> mutual respect. <laughs> yeah, mutual respect. You don't come in my house and try to tell me what to do. I won't come in your house to tell you what to do. Yeah, <laughs> but then, but then a little bit the other way around. So I, I, I prepare my compost using the soil food web um, uh, methodology. Great. So we are looking in the in the microscopes and awesome. and. And 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 then this world is opening up, and you you woo, and you see them, and you and you are going to love them. Yeah, yeah it, and it they're a lot of fun to watch. You you know you get it in a yeah. container where you can see through and and watch the um, the animal do its thing for a while, and then you let it go because it's got to be nerve wracking to be in that situation, but. It, the things that they carry on their bodies are a lot of microorganisms that are very, very beneficial, and we need to get them moved through the whole entire ecosystem. So instead of making compost teas and compost extracts, just make sure you have enough bees and that mm -hmm. you've applied this really good biology in the soil and it's getting on the surfaces of the plants so the bees will do that work for you. Something less that you as a farmer have to do if you've got bees out there doing their job. So they are not only pollinating, they are uh, moving these uh, microorganisms around. Yep, absolutely. Especially yeah. the, the soil dwelling ones that, you know, everything they contact during the day and then they're um brushing that up the, uh, against the soil particles, against the plants, the whatever, whenever they're taking a stroll outside. Um, so another important component of that food web. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think that's another form of pollination. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> it's always about perspective. Yeah, it's, it's just a bacterium and fungi don't usually get called pollen. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a um, unique name for them elaine yeah oh new <laughs> <laughs> our polybacks <laughs> yes so that taxi, this that taxi cups is also yeah. a good word i think this question here is one that a lot of folks on this planet may face time to time is just like how do you face drought lack of flowers in arid landscapes to maintain healthy beehives esmeralda thank you for your question why do I get all these questions about honeybees? 
<laughs> I was focusing on solitary bees. Um, no, droughts is a problem. Of course, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. Honeybees need about 75 kg of honey made from an enormous amount of nectar. There's only nectar in the plants if there's water in the roots. So no rain, no and droughts, there's, there's little or no nectar, and they will starve. That's how it's going. What we would want to do is make sure that the bi biology in the soil is correct to build the structure to hold whatever rainwater comes infiltrates, whatever snow might melt down. And that means your root systems will have the water that they need through the growing season. But yeah. you got to get rid of that compacted out, um, agricultural yeah. land. That's that puts a you know knell of death yeah. on it. So get that structure rebuilt by getting yeah. that biology in the soil. And you don't you can worry less about exactly. And then you see um, if you have these native plants and herbs are far more resistant uh, to droughts than uh, cult cultivated grasses and, and, and crops. So these native herbs will help you get this uh, soil uh, rebuilt and, and keep the water in it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not about honeybees, it's about soil. And, and, and get this, get this <laughs> <The> native species. <laughs> well, um, they, all, so, they all work together. If you didn't yeah. have every step along the way, you're not going to get honey. Well, so we're not going to have beautiful flowers. We're not, we're going to have a dearth of food. So it, we just have to keep working on it together. Mm -hmm. So now you might want to discuss the difference between nectar and pollen. Yeah. I didn't really hear that in the conversation yet. Yeah. You. Yeah. Good question. So pollen is the, is the uh, uh, protein source and that is the male part of the seed. What is when it's pollinated, it's the pollen going on the to the female part of the seed, where the egg part, where the seed is growing, um, and and that is protein. And then you have uh, flowers uh, producing nectar in the flower or uh, between the leaves, and that's the sweet. Um, substantia, substantia that's uh, from which honeybees uh, make honey and that is a sugar uh, substantia so it's very rich in sugars and it uh, gives them energy so with um, with all bees all and many more insects need nectar as as a biofuel to be able to fly from the nest to the flowers. And then they collect pollen to feed their larvae. And, and, and then when they get pollen from one flower, they go to another flower to get some more pollen. And then the flower gets a little bit of that pollen from the first flower. And then you get cross-pollination and seeds with a, a diversity of uh, genetic diversity. Yes, thank you for that question. There's, there's one more. I, I, I don't know um, if you told them about uh, the because you were discussing that it's all about sex, and I, I wonder if you explain the difference between the males and the females because that is is, is relatively dramatic. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> That is for an advanced course. <laughs> uh, okay, there we now go. Now we want a small taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, um, if it, the, so, these these uh, male bees 
they are there only when there's when there is f- females and in this in the wild bees there all the females are queens and in the honeybees there's only one queen and one and small princesses so only when the princesses are there there are also the males and then there is um a, a mating and um for the for the honeybees this is uh, quite dramatic because when the the princess is going on the queen flight on the, on her mating flight then you you will have drones from all different hives that were waiting somewhere in the landscape where is this um, princess coming and when she is flying off she is guarded by by many bees around her and then this this all these drones are flying after after her and this this guarding bees they are looking that no drone from the same hive is mating with the princess only from other hives are mating with her and then the first one is mating and then after mating he's exploding and he's falling from her dead up off and then but there will be a next one coming and he is also mating with her and he's exploding also after mating and he's like a little uh, a bomb a little drone bomb uh, and so she is she is um, uh, pollinated by uh, by about 10 to 12 drones and from each of them she's keeping a little tiny bit of um, uh, sperms and she's keeping that for her whole life and she's living about four years in a separate place in her body and every time when she's laying an egg she is feel, she's uh, measuring the size of the cell and then she's knowing oh, this is a cell for a female. And then she is putting a little bit of sperm to to her egg. And when she is measuring the size, bigger size for the drones, she's not putting uh, sperms with it. So all the drones are genetically identical to their mother, to the queen. And all the worker bees, they are having the part of their father and of the queen. And you can see that because they are sister groups of half sisters in one hive. And so the hive is is a very complex um, genetic structure and they have all different kinds of capabilities through that this queen at the one time she's going for mating is mating with several drones. So, like you said, now I cannot unsee drones as like little fireworks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and I think this is one that a lot of folks uh, might face, is uh, how to promote the protection of bees in urban cities. How can we address the fear of people of having an overpopulation of bees in urban areas? Thank you, Alison. Um, now, so uh, the basis is biodiversity. Cities, um, at least in the Netherlands, again, with so much monocultures and industrialized agricultures, cities are the bee oasis for honeybees and and but mainly for solitary bees so there are many more species of solitary bees living in the cities nowadays than in the on the farmlands than than or in nature <laughs> um, from what we have left so the cities are the place to be for them but they only um, uh, can be there Um, as long as there's enough native species and as I pointed out in the in the in the slides you have to have all these layers so it's about uh, water plants but then the uh, water at the plants there they are very important especially when there are droughts 
grassland plants, so don't mow too much, yeah? so sometimes, but not too much, not every week or something, um, no lawns. Um, and then you have this, uh, these layers of the shrubs and bushes and small, um, uh, small uh, trees and the huge trees and then the climbing uh, climbers in the trees. So you can work in cities very well to get all these layers present. And you will see everywhere uh, where that these layers are not complete. And so everywhere where it is destructed, the function is destructed and you can um, add on native species to, to make these layers complete in the cities. Yeah. yeah. Great. I want to be thoughtful with your time. Uh, so do you want to answer more, one more question or how do you feel? Can it go over five minutes or? Um, I'm not stressed I mean, about time, but you you are the timekeeper. No, no I, I I would be I would be very happy if 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 uh, to know what native species do you see around? Where mm -hmm. do you observe your insects flying to? So let's do this. We have a bunch of tons of questions, and this sounds like an another section of webinar. So let's leave this time for uh, your last words for the day, for Sune, Elaine, and John. Yeah, um, my my last word would 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 be um, as soon as you leave now the computer, go outside and look for a plant what is flowering. And then just take a minute or two to, to see what is flying around. And do this today and tomorrow and for two weeks and observe what, uh, what change does it bring to you if you stand quiet observing and trying to look through the eyes of the bees. Why is this bee there? Why are these insects there? Then you will change uh, make a huge, huge change. And yeah. I just want to correct myself because last words sounded very bad. I'm sorry. So close the statements for the day, Elaine and John, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would love to um, work on putting bees into our understanding of the soil food web. Um, Maybe not honeybees because they're mostly out there, but especially the ones that are um, producing um, their uh, tunnels and they're you know, escaping into the ground. That sounds like something that's really going to be af affecting um, how nutrients flow and cycle and the species of bacteria and fungi, protozoa, and nematodes. So, so you've uh, opened up a whole new part of science. Yeah, It'd be exciting. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's also nice to see how this is all related, yeah, and how how they uh, live together and they cooperate together. And now, what can we learn from the bees? What can we learn from the fungi and from the uh, soil organisms? It's and hopefully, uh, it, it allows us as human beings to work less out in the garden or the fields um, because we're putting back the normal structures, the normal interactions, and those organisms do all the work exactly. that the plants require. Yeah. Yeah. John? <clears throat> yes. Uh, well, I would just say that I think that um, what Sona has been doing, and I have attended a few of the of the courses um, and listened in and saw the films that she's made. It's, it's extraordinary. And uh, I think that it's going to be really good to have uh, a, an international course on beekeeping and on, on bees, just on understanding bees, understanding the importance of bees um, at the Soil Food Web School coming forward. So everybody should uh, 
tell everybody how wonderful this is and let's get the course up on the Soil Food Web School and people are gonna really enjoy that. Thank you for coming thank and listening. You. In thank the you, name, John. yeah, thank you, John. In the name of the school, I want to shout out for the background team that we have here doing wonders, helping us make this very smooth. Thank you all for spending this amazing time with us today. I had a blast. I learned a lot of things, and I will follow your advice. Every time that I'm out, I'm going to stop and see how many bees I can see along the day. So in, once more, thank you guys so much for being part of this webinar and see you guys next time. Stay safe, everyone. Take yeah. care. Thank you. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.